Hey, how's it going? This is Matt here from Silver Fortune. So as I said yesterday, one of my announcements, my video yesterday, today is uh, my my discussion with uh, Lewis from his channel, Smile Gold. I wouldn't call it an interview because uh, I see us as peers and, and I see us as a... Uh, this is not just him talking and me asking questions and vice versa. This is more of a discussion than anything else. Um, so uh, first of all, I guess thanks for coming on, even though it's just as much me coming on your channel because we, we both share these videos. But I guess, how are you doing today, Lewis? I'm doing grand. How are you doing, Matt? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. I'm uh, happy that this week is, is just about over and get on with the weekend. And, um, you know, I think there's some really interesting things to to. Uh, I guess, observe in the markets this week, a very interesting week, especially in, in the stock market, because that's what everybody uh, is is paying attention to, or at least the mainstream media, a very weak, uh, weak, week for, for stocks. Um, they, it seems like they, uh, they they kept heading down at, at times, looking like they were in free fall. And then there was a bounce and, and each bounce was met with selling ultimately. And they kind of turned into a, a dead cat bounce. Um, so I guess maybe we could start off with that. And, and, and what significance do you think that uh, can, can you attribute to the recent weakness for the stock market? You know, how much lower do you see it going, I guess, or, or whatever? And, and also maybe relate that to uh, some of the recent moves in, in uh, the precious metals market. I think what we've seen, that is interest rates finally starting to bite. And it's something that generally has a delayed effect on the markets and also on the economy. And I think you've seen the Fed very often raising rates when and continuing to raise rates when, in retrospect, the economy had already started to slow. And sometimes they're so late into raising rates when the economy is already in a recession. And I'm not saying that we're in a recession right now, but the third quarter growth was down from the second quarter growth the way they calculate it. And I wouldn't be surprised to see the fourth quarter growth slow even further and they're still talking about continuing to raise interest rates and that's in an environment where the ECB is still at zero they're still talking about not raising the rates until later next year they're still doing stimulus China just announced that they did 380 billion worth of stimulus in the third quarter um, Bank of England, all of the banks, Bank of Japan, are either at zero interest rates, negative interest rates, and are still doing massive QE. And the U.S. is dependent upon the fiscal stimulus of the tax cuts, which probably doesn't, it's more of a one-off where they got their, their bonuses from their employers and now have really adjusted their they're living from their paycheck, which shows a little bit more money in there, but it's not the same as when interest rates are low for a prolonged period of time. So we're seeing the weakness now in the housing market, and that ripples through the economy because of home builders and real estate agents and commissions. And so I think what's happening is the stock market is starting to realize what's the next impetus to go higher. Well, it can't be earnings. I heard you talking about Tesla the other day. Now, they had <laughs> these surprise earnings, but looking forward to big picture, it doesn't seem likely that companies that don't have earnings historically show a big quarter that somehow they're going to sustain earnings. And if you think about cars, they're required a low interest rate environment as well because people borrow money to buy the cars. And as rates go higher, then those types of loans can't be made. And then also those loans can't be paid because you start to get default. So it could be, you know, we've been in this business now for a few years talking about financial collapse, debt unsustainable, get your gold and silver. <laughs> and it's no, and it's and it's been a very long slog because it's just managed to always get a second wind each time we see. Uh, weakness we saw it in early 2016 we had stock market fall or every year we seem to have it looks like this is it it's finally going to run out of steam and then they somehow pull some credit <laughs> something credit driven out of a hat and but at some point it looks like the u.s has already decided or the fed has to continue to raise rates it looks like they're determined to do that and that could be the thing that breaks this because it increases the cost of debt service and you know china can continue 
with their Ponzi scheme and build an infrastructure. But you know, they you talked about this as well. They've probably already reached their Minsky moment. I think the U.S. is what they're trying to do, or the Fed is trying to do, is cushion a credit crisis blow by increasing the interest rates, slowing the economy down, and they're trying to reduce debt. But the the Congress isn't abiding by that. They've increased the deficit. So really, no no country has prepared to stop this global credit-driven Ponzi scheme. You, know, you see a couple of countries buying a little gold, but not in any amounts that's really going to cushion the blow. So where do you see it headed? Yeah, you know, to speak to that, I mean, I guess two, two, two interesting observations. Um, a, you're right. I mean, we haven't talked about this for years. And, and I think a very important lesson that I think many people will soon learn, I'm, I'm you know, I didn't learn all that long ago either, is that uh, debt and uh, credit-driven expansion of the economy can continue for a very long time. But of course, um, and, and seem to not matter. That, that's the funny thing is it just doesn't seem to matter, all this increase in debt. Uh, but but it, it, one of the number one things that, that does make it matter, and I think we've learned this time and time again, you can see it time and time again, whether you're looking at the Fed funds rate or the yield on the U.S. tenure, is that raising uh, rising rates make that debt matter. All of a sudden, it matters. And I think we're seeing cracks forming. Um, you know, I've been talking about uh, Bank OZK, uh, which which Zero Hedge, actually, shortly after I, uh, I published a video, they actually were talking about how, you know, is that this cycle's countrywide financial? Um, it's a, a relatively small regional bank that uh, recently has, has sustained some serious losses because of uh, essentially some, some uh, defaults on, on some major loans uh, that they've had on their balance sheet for a long time. Um, so r rising rates, I mean, that's when, that's when you really have to start paying attention to this stuff because that's when debt actually starts to matter. And, and, and you know, the other thing is, is you're talking about this, um, they're always pulling some new trick out of their hat uh, for the last you know, couple of years now. And, and it seems to be that it's always coming from, you know, one of the major uh, central bank, you know, the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, um, maybe the Bank of England to a smaller extent, and certainly uh, People's Bank of China. And then you have the governments too and their fiscal stimulus, China's fiscal, fiscal stimulus, uh, the U.S. and our uh, fiscal stimulus through through tax cuts and through lots of spending, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, but this time around, I, I would agree that, you know, the Fed tightening is, is kind of the outlier. Uh, you, you still have a lot of central banks and a lot of governments continuing with their with their accommodative or their stimulating type of, of policies. Uh, but as a whole, they, they are somewhat moving in that direction. Uh, China in the last year, I would say, has reacted less forcefully, less uh, swiftly to, to some economic weakness um, than they have in the past. And again, I think it goes back to them trying to perhaps do what the Fed is doing, and that's reduce some of these bubbles and, and hopefully you know, hope for, for a, a soft land into their economy. Uh, the ECB remains accommodative, very accommodative, but they are moving towards the end of their QE program actually by the end of the year. Um, Bank of Japan, that's, I don't know if they're ever going to stop quantitative easing. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but as a whole, they are moving in that direction. And I think we're getting to a point here where unless something big changes, we need some new Hat, a uh, new trick to be pulled out of this hat in the next you know, six months, 12 months to really reverse this, whether it's a, a huge stimulus from, from China, even larger than what they've been recently doing. Um, uh, ECB going back on, uh, Mario Draghi going back in his word to, to stop quantitative easing or some additional fiscal stimulus or the Fed, you know, something has to reverse or at some point we've, we've kind of crossed that line where eventually those things are going to come, but I think it's going to be too little too late and, and we're going to have that, that global economic downturn that we've been talking about for so long it's just going to be uh they're, they're not going to stop it in time eventually maybe through through qe through fiscal stimulus but it's going to be too little uh too late i think when it's all said and done um so i think that's kind of where we're at right now i mean these rising rates uh they, they are weighing, weighing on the economy and uh i think we're it, it's funny you know every time um the stock markets drop uh these past couple of weeks the you know cnbc and the mainstream media they're looking for an ex explanation uh, and sometimes it's it's you know a little bit obvious okay caterpillar and 3m they report poor earnings or today it was uh amazon and uh uh google i think that reported poor earnings uh but as a whole that's not why stocks have dropped 10 percent you know as a whole uh, i would look to um fears about maybe slowing of china's economy 
uh, trade war fears and of course uh, Fed tightening. I mean that's that's kind of some of the big overarching things that we're looking at here. And and of course uh, the the day to day analysts kind of just totally missed out on that. I think what's going to happen is the Fed's going to continue to take the opportunity to raise the interest rates, and then don't be surprised if once they stop raising rates or they'll start talking about loosening rates again and start talking about that and that might you know put another boost under the economy that the fed is thinking about sure. and you know remember when they did they did the taper tantrum where they kept talking about when they were going to end it even though they they went on for months continuing with qe right. they and started they jawboning taper talk i think they're going to start talking about stopping raising rates and then for months and months and months and then they're going to start talking about cutting rates for months and months and months and get the benefit of that because when you start talking like that people get forward looking and they say oh it's safe to buy stocks again fed's going to stop raising rates oh fed's going to actually cut rates and they don't have to cut them for a year or two and then they and then, and then i think once the fed starts cutting rates that's when the other countries start raising rates and maybe they think they can pull it off and continue just to keep people interested in the equity and bond markets and away from the gold and silver that's what seems to be happening and that's yeah. what has happened yeah and i, I think it's yeah it's, it's going to start on the periphery and it's going to become more than just um you know maybe the president some of his advisors and then uh uh who was it neil kashkari uh the minneapolis fed president or, or governor or whatever uh that's calling for lower rates it's, it's going to you're going to see some prominent um economists some uh or analysts, you know, come out, and then and then you're going to see some more uh, Fed members, non-voting or voting, come out and say maybe we're getting kind of close to that moment where we should think about pumping the brakes on this, uh, slowing down uh, with, with this interest rate, and then you're going to see Powell eventually kind of move in that direction as well. I th I would agree. It's just a matter of, uh, as you said, in the past they've been too slow. Are they going to be too slow right. this time around as well? And and I, I, U.S. monetary policy it can turn on a dime when it absolutely needs to, but as a whole in the last ten years it's been like turning around. Uh, a, a cruise ship it, very slow right. and so um what and about these ta what about these tax cuts they're talking about no uh, yeah well <laughs> do you think they'll uh, actually do them i wouldn't i wouldn't be surprised if they did it's it's a uh, you know i guess the, the the political side of it I, it's it's clearly very politically motivated considering we're, we're you know two weeks away from the election mm -hmm. um and and i i guess i always you know tell my viewers that you know tax cuts are great in theory, and I, and and I'm uh, not a big fan of you know the whole income tax and the government you know taking that money in the first place. Uh, and and I love it when when um, even Republican uh, politicians will say we're we're putting more money back in the pocket of Americans. I'm like, no, you're just taking less money out of the pockets. But <laughs> but uh, but it's um, it's an interesting uh, thing because it, because it, it is positive. I mean, they're they're taking less money out. But I also always tell my viewers that long term, maybe not over the next 12 months, 24 months, but long term, you're going to see that tax come back and it's going to be through, you know, inflation um, or or else uh, crushing, crushing, um, rising interest rates because because of the rising debt. Uh, same thing goes with because they have because they haven't cut spending. Right. Exactly. I mean, if anything, spending has continued to to increase there's always something new to find uh, for for spending and so you know short term you, sure you can boost economic numbers with tax cuts with with uh with um fiscal spending but w what is it that that crushes growth long term that's rising rates and so i mean they they're, they're really putting themselves in a tough position um the 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 current administration and not to say that it's all his fault or anything but they they've had some time to to i guess change and and um Right now, I think I think the, the the position they're putting themselves in is rising deficits, which inevitably will will lead to I think rising rates, and then you you, you have to choose between rising rates or or uh, Fed intervention and monetization of debt or whatever, um, and then you're dealing with with a with a whole other monster of of inflation. So I mean it's a uh, and this is long term stuff. Again, over the short term, sure you, you're going to get more votes. Uh, consumers will have more money in their pockets, whatnot. But but long term, rising rates, inflation, uh, they will all pay for the tax cut one way or another. You know, unless you have spending cuts that go along with it. Um, no, it is it is possible. There is one theory. You know, the Laffer curve. It hasn't shown up yet. In that, when you lower rates, that you could eventually hit a sweet spot where you actually take in more tax revenue because of increased mm -hmm. economic production now they sh i've looked at the tax revenues coming in 
they're not increasing, they're decreasing as a result of <laughs> them charge, you know, p taking uh, less money out. But they say that if there's an economic boom, this was Laffer during the Reagan years, and they showed it during the Kennedy years, that the economy does better, so people make more money, wages increase, more economic activity, everyone pays, uh, even at a lower rate, they end up paying more taxes. I don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, they didn't promise that, but and if it doesn't happen and the spending increases, I mean, they're showing no signs of cutting any of the entitlements or any of the military spending. You know, all the big ticket items, they're all they're not talking about cutting them at all. So, yeah, as you yeah, say, yeah, it's a yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I, I agree with that in, in, in theory that there, there is some element to truth of that, that you might see increased tax revenue, certainly better uh, increased economic growth. But. I don't. I don't see it this time around. I, I the, the deficits continue to, to rise, um, and, and along with those deficits, so do rates, and so do, uh, do so does the cost of uh, the, the interest expense for the federal government. There is another another theory that the increased tariffs, if they do not result in freer trade and lower tariffs, that the United States could make up some of the deficit in the billions that it will collect. This is what Trump was trying to say. Mm -hmm. And tariffs. Now, the government used to be funded when it was much smaller, before there was an income tax, pretty much solely the federal government, on tariffs. Um, today, obviously, you could never fund it just on uh, on tariffs. But, you probably uh, have a hard time just funding, funding like, you know, the, uh, I don't know, Department of Homeland Security alone. <laughs> exactly. I, don't know what, I don't know what the numbers are, but it's, yeah, it's nowhere close. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess uh, you, you could see some, I guess, but 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 again, you know, the the um, I, I see tariffs as as and I think you would agree. I, I get what you're saying, because we've talked about this in the past about how hopefully the, the long term outcome of this of this trade war and of these tariffs is freer trade and decreased tariffs. Uh, right. But but short term, I think we'd agree that tariffs are a negative for economic growth. Um, and, oh, and I think clearly, like, and the longer they go on, the more negative they are, and no, and no one wins. Their only work is if, if as you say, the two countries realize, hey, we can't go on with these high tariffs on each other now that we've retaliated. Let's get to the table and lower them both for us or eliminate them. That would be a good result. But they're saying now, uh, Kudlow and Trump, they're not ready to talk China. So that just means that. The American soybean farmers don't get to export as many soybeans. Uh, we don't get to bring in uh, Chinese goods at the lower price because there's a tariff on them. And in the short term, that's not good. And the longer that goes on, that becomes midterm not good. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I see um, the, the timeline for this. I, I, th I think Trump, if he, if that's his intention to negotiate lower, lower uh, tariffs or, or freer trade long term. I think the timeline's running out. I, I think the reaction to this trade war coincided with quite a bit of economic weakness in China in uh, for, for most of 2018. And, and they've really been feeling the heat. And I think a lot of analysts are correct in saying that right now, Trump has the upper hand in this trade war um, because the U.S., certainly in the markets as well as the economy, we haven't seen the same impact, seen the same impact in, in terms of data, in terms of where the markets are heading yet. <laughs> But I think that's coming. It's only a matter of time. And I think the, the time is running out in terms of how much longer he has to uh, really make a move but before his position is, is weakened as well. I, I guess that's where I see it right now. No, I agree. China's, you know, was already slowing down. China was caught off guard by this. They had talked about uh, trying to deleverage and trying to move to a services economy. And they know that the best way to boost their economy is not by deleveraging and it's not by moving the services it's by pumping the real estate market and pumping the the building sector and that's basically what they had to revert to because they had counted in their models you know it's all government controlled that they would have all this export revenue coming in to a lot of the state-owned enterprises and now that that's been got that's gone they had to lower taxes they had to increase subsidies but that didn't help that only helped those firms but it didn't help grow the economy it kept those where they feel comfortable with, so they had to go and do stimulus, and they had to do more infrastructure, and they have to see what they can do, and they have to loan more money, and basically the deleveraging that they thought they started eight, seven, eight months ago, it's long since gone, and now they're on a big upswing again on credit creation, which overall isn't, isn't going to be good, and it's the same with the dollarizing. All these countries, including China, a lot of their debts denominated in dollars, 
And as dollars get more expensive, that makes it even more expensive for them to pay. Yeah, so you know, Turkey. yeah. I mean, you're you're talking about. I, I think it's so interesting China's housing market. Um, uh, pe- people uh, talk about China's stock market being, I think, officially in, in a bear market, or a lot of their indices this year. Um, not understanding that stocks don't play as large a role in their their society and their economy as the uh, housing market, or not even housing, but but real estate market in China. Um, and I think that's an important thing to to kind of remind our viewers is that. The, the Chinese real estate market has been crucial, not just their economy, but just that market has been crucial to any growth, I think, global economic growth that we've seen since uh, since the recession. And and when that bubble pops, I mean, I think that maybe maybe you disagree, but there's potential of being a much larger bubble popping event than uh, the, the U.S. housing bubble popping back in, in 2007, just because of its of its size and its importance to uh, economic growth. Well, as I mentioned, in the United States, the real estate market is important because of new home building. But if you think about what they do in China, it's not new home building. It's massive 70, 80 story uh, monstrosities that use massive amounts of concrete labor. And, you know, those are things that uh, they got to keep building bridges. I mean, the U.S. is not engaged in that type of construction. That was one of the things they thought the Trump economy was going to be good for, was he was going to pass. That's the one thing he hasn't done of all the things on his list or tried to do is the infrastructure package. Yeah. He hasn't, he hasn't been talking about that at all, um, building the, the bridges, fixing the airports, all that kind of stuff. Maybe he'll save that till next year. And again, that's another thing that if that catches hold, that could boost the stock market, all the the commodity com- companies and staple items, you'll start to see possibly increased interest in the stock market because there's going to be government spending. And that's generally, you know, they find ways to boost the economy. And the difference between, like, what you and I might do, you know, you got a credit card, it's got $10,000 of credit on it, you can spend and spend and spend, and then you hit your credit limit, and maybe you can get them to give you another 1000 the, the problem with these people are they, they have unlimited credit. They're the ones who control the issuance of credit. That's what a central bank does, the money and credit. So they just keep expanding it. And because they're all expanding it, none of them seem to care that they're all ex- – I, I, it was interesting. When the Fed first did QE, there was a huge uproar. Like, what the hell are you doing? You can't do this. You, well, now the ECB's been doing it bigger in, <laughs> than, than the U.S. China has forgotten – that they were upset about. They do more credit creation than anyone. Japan had been doing it. They never stopped. They've been doing it for 20, 25 years. That's the danger because they all consider each other's debt instruments as assets. They hold U.S. treasuries. Yeah. They hold all these fiat currencies as assets on their balance sheets when they're nothing more than promises to pay in amounts that they can't pay. But, you know, we've already we've been through this. If, if, if the U.S. was unsustainable at, you know, $9 trillion, why not 20 Well, it is 20 now. I mean, why not 30 It's the same with China. Why not continue? You know, everybody says at some point, but no one knows what that point is. And that's why, you know, moving it back to gold and silver, it, it really has been a, a divergence, at least when the money creation was moving up. You know, from 2008 to 2011, 12, 13, you saw the precious metals prices moving in tandem. That's split. The credit's gone bonkers since 2013 worldwide, not just the U.S., and the gold and silver prices haven't reacted. And that's the only way I can explain that is that capital went into chasing equities, bonds, and some of the printed money went towards shorting. Uh, the the gold and silver prices. Sure, absolutely. I mean, it's it, it in a in a perfect universe and in, in a universe that is is uh, markets that are built on on fundamentals and and fundamentals that uh, I guess follow a, an accurate representation of what happens when when credit increases at the pace that it has been increasing. You know, precious metals would be. Um, 
it'd be a natural buy-in. I mean, they, they're, they're the hedge against things like what happens if uh, debt is too high and it needs to be monetized, or the alternative is is what if debt happens too high and we run into a default situation, which I think at the government level is unlikely. Um, they're the hedge for that. And yet along the way, you've seen silver and gold drop uh, and, uh, and and stocks go up. You know, the, you, you know that line, hold on me, you know that line that you can watch from 2008 to 2011 of the precious metals prices going up? Mm-hmm. That should have continued along with the credit creation through QE3 and through the rest of the global. Instead, the equity markets took that tact. Right. You know, and, and that's almost to I'm, I'm not going to um, propose that this is this should all it all be the reality. But you and I are both familiar with with people that comment or people that create videos or posts or whatever about what the U.S. debt clock says silver and gold should be valued at. And, and it's 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 a uh, what is it? Um, Six hundred. Yeah, yeah. It's it's hundreds, and it's I think it's based on amount of silver that is uh, supply coming onto the market each year. Right. Um, yeah. The M two change in M two divided by silver coming off the market, or whatever. And, and I don't think that at all is it it, it. it makes its point. I think people a lot a lot of people misinterpret it though. Unfortunately. Oh, they tell um, me they try to tell me that that's what it should be. And I was like, mm, I, don't, I mean, I understand how they calculate it, but that's not what it's going to be. No, no, and but but it, you know, if it uh, if they've done a better job of explaining it, it makes a very valid point. It kind of yes. similar to the point that you're making right here that that uh, you know, that type of credit creation should be followed by an increase in in, in precious metals, and yet it hasn't. You know, I did want to for for our viewers' sake as well. I did want to bring up kind of the recent action in precious metals uh, because in the last two weeks we've seen uh, I'd, I'd say. Uh, a couple of trends, at least, that I, I want to pick up on. First of all, we've seen a lot of weakness in equities worldwide, uh, as well as in here in the United States. A lot of, of indices are now in or near correction mode in the United States. You've also seen silver and gold go up to sideways. You know, silver, silver is, is still under 15, but, but gold has seen a little bit more strength, but up to sideways, okay, along that time. But what's really interesting I think a lot of people would say, well, you know, if silver and gold are going up while the stock market's crash, it doesn't mean it's because the stock market's crashing. Maybe we're seeing, you know, dollar weakness or something like that. But along that same time period, we've also seen a fair amount of dollar strength, not a ton, but we have seen some dollar strength. And mm -hmm. also uh, bringing the Chinese yuan into the conversation, we've seen uh, yuan weakness. We've seen that whole correlation between gold and yuan uh, break and the yuan has, has weakened and gold has uh, gone up. Um, so maybe you can speak a bit to that. Uh, do, you, do you think that this is something that, that, that those correlations, or at least with the dollar and gold and silver, are eventually going to catch up again? Or is this investors maybe finally a bit, a bit of a safe hidden bid, at least into the paper markets, and investors maybe catching up on, on uh, what's happening in the markets, what's happening with, with the Fed tightening? That's a good question. And, and every night on my small gold live stream, I've been cognizant to show the Dow gold ratio because I do think that while some people say the dollar is the anti-gold I also think the stock market is the anti-gold and that um, what we saw in the last couple of years as the stock market rose I think that takes money away from gold so the Dow gold ratio rose so back in 2016 when gold was doing really well and the stock market looked like it was at the end of its bull market before trump got elected the dow gold ratio was down to 13 to 1. now when gold really takes off it can go almost as low as one to one but um what happened from 2017 since trump got elected until pretty much the last couple of months was the stock market took off and then the dow gold ratio got up to 22 to 1 and I think it when when equities are doing well, there's an opportunity cost for people. A lot of gold investors aren't people who buy from the U.S. Mint or from SD Bullion. You know, they they buy ETFs and they just track yeah. the price. So if equities are doing better than the price of gold or silver, they'll chase the equities. And I think what's a lot of people are probably traders are shifting money as they see these gyrations in the stock market and gyrations generally going lower that they are moving the their monies into the precious metals and you're seeing that strength since the end of september all month all october 
They've been more than sideways because we've gone from under fourteen dollars to fourteen sixty five. We've gone from you know eleven seventy in gold to twelve thirty. So they have been grinding higher. And um, there's been and I I track this and I thought it was happening again today and that's why I was a little surprised that as the stock markets pretty much did another nosedive today, gold and silver came out of the chute like okay we're going to go higher, and they got batted back down. And they didn't really take off as much as I thought they might have. But again, they did close higher. And I think there is a bit of a, a nervousness that equities have not much further to go and that there is money moving to gold and silver. Now, I have another theory, Matt, which I haven't shared with you. I actually think this is all in preparation to establishing a crypto bubble because I think that's where they, there's far more opportunity for Wall Street than just gold and silver because cryptos can be priced at whatever the heck they want them to be. And we've already seen they managed before Wall Street was even involved. Last, last year at this time, they drove Bitcoin up to $20,000 without any real institutional investment. And we're seeing this Microsoft, New York Stock Exchange backed project. You're seeing Fidelity getting into crypto trading, SDTG Ameritrade. They're talking about gold, uh, Bitcoin ETFs. I think that's where Wall Street is looking for their, their way to continue this overvalued stock and equity price rally because I don't think they can justify pushing the fangs any higher or Tesla much higher, equities much higher, but they clearly can come out with all these pie-in-the-sky crypto products, registered ICOs, and who knows what they're worth. They don't even have to have earnings. They could just say, hey, everybody's buying them. So that's where I think they're, the next move really is going to be because rationally and logically, I don't think you could take the stock markets much higher, and I think uh, we'll, we'll see some spillover into gold and silver for safety. But I think they love the speculation, and I think they're going to push a crypto bubble in the next you know, year to five years just to keep the, the money flowing on Wall Street. Yeah, they get you know. storage fees, they get <laughs> trading fees, ICO fees, and then they have analyst fees, try, people pretending they understand these things. A lot of money in that. Yeah, I, I guess a couple thoughts on that is, is uh, uh, A, you're right. I mean, valuations for cryptos don't really matter. Stocks, valuations should matter. They definitely don't seem like they have been. Although right. you saw some FANG stocks really get hammered down today. Um, you know, for, for, for silver and gold, valuations matter because you have things like uh, cost to mine and, and what right. um, what uh, 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 industrial users want to pay for the metals and whatnot. I mean, you, have that, a fi that, you have a finite amount of them yes. and you have a certain amount of demand, you know. Yes, yes. Whereas cryptos, you, you, yeah, we, we saw that at the end of 2017, uh, the, the crypto mania. And, and I mean, that's an interesting theory. I mean, I haven't paid a ton of attention to, to cryptos, you know, as of late. But but that does, you know, it kind of reminds me of when, when you're talking about chasing that uh, bubbles, uh, chasing volatility or whatever, you know. I've been saying is, that they need a and want a crypto bubble because if you think what's gone on since 1987 – They've never allowed asset valuations to drop. There's always a bubble on the horizon. People like Krugman, uh, Yellen, Bernanke always say, Wait, Greenspan, we're going to need a bubble. Well, what bubble is there? They can't reflate the housing bubble. They can't reflate the dot-com bubble. They can't reflate the social media bubble. You know, so, so what's next? The only thing I can see that they can reflate or inflate would be this crypto stuff and I'm just seeing too many of these big Wall Street firms either uh, being very transparent about getting into it or like Goldman Sachs investing in companies like Circle, which invest in companies along with Coinbase. And, and I'm just seeing that they're they're placing their bets quietly. And the other thing I'm seeing is the media is paying little attention to it. They're not bashing cryptos. They're not promoting cryptos. And I think that's all a setup for next year when this they see the the stock market running out of steam and they still want their trading fees, their storage fees, their investment banking fees, their startup fees, and their home runs coming out of IPOs. Well, they're going to have to get them out of ICOs, I think. I, I, I just can't see how they can continue to push companies with no earnings and expect you know central banks buy them. But at some point, like you say, there is a limit even to fantasy. But the thing about cryptos, they're all fantasy. I mean, what's a Bitcoin worth? 
you could say zero, and you can make an argument it's just nothing, or you can make an argument it's worth twenty thousand, already was, or you could say it's worth fifty thousand, a hundred thousand, who knows? And and if you have these large institutional entities pumping them and actually investing in them, it's the whole that's see the thing, the only reason a company like Tesla is worth anything is because even the Swiss National Bank buys it. Yeah. It's not based on valuation, and all the institutional investors buy it. Why? Because it's backed by Wall Street. Now they're talking that uh, one of their companies, SpaceX, wants to borrow $500 billion and have Goldman Sachs arrange it. I'm sure they can. Not based on, Because someone's doing somebody a favor in that whole money game, and they know that they're going to get their money back. That, yeah. that's, what's, that's what's unbelievable about these stock valuations is, I'm old enough to remember you couldn't go public unless you had three or four years of profits. Now you now there's companies been public for ten to fifteen years and have never had a profit. Right. I mean you you look at a company like Tesla, which I could rant about for quite some time, or or Snapchat, you know, uh, the right. companies that are, are uh, somehow profits don't play into their business plan. Uh, it's always a very uh, far off notion. Not, not unlike with cryptocurrencies, uh, widespread adoption of, of a given uh, crypto. Uh, is always a, a far away notion. It's it's something that'll happen eventually. Something that'll happen naturally, uh, apparently. And, and maybe that's the case. But um, I mean, a who who says it's going to be one versus another? And b right uh, th that timeline can can take a very long time. But but you know, it, we, we for a while, and maybe this is still the case um, in China. We we saw these types of of rolling bubbles. I mean, you see in the United States uh, in a very pronounced way, um, whether it's the tech bubble in two thousand. The housing bubble in the mid 2000s, uh, and and you know what everyone called the everything bubble right now. You know you had right. similar bubbles in in speculative bubbles in, in China there for a while, where you'd have um, just kind of ridiculous uh, different commodities or or um, you know things like I think it was apples, not not the company but like apples uh, a couple of years ago became a huge speculative uh, play in in China for for probably a period of weeks before it, it ultimately popped. Um, and I wonder if you know if you're right. I mean, if if, if it's going to be cryptos, uh, if it's their their time. I think that, I think it has to be. Again. I don't I don't see how they avoid uh, because they can't have a collapse. They have to have reflating of assets because they don't they don't run the economy based on production anymore or profits. They run it on asset values. And the yeah. problem with a housing pro a housing bubble is you really can't make. Like the type of houses that we live into, into eight million dollar houses, everyone on your block lives on a twelve million dollar because there's not the income to support them. So yeah. then you go to stocks and you say, well, yeah, Tesla could be four hundred, maybe five hundred, maybe six hundred, but there is a limit. I mean, you know, well, maybe there isn't, but with cryptocurrencies, those limits aren't anywhere within anyone's rationality because once cryptocurrencies, if Bitcoin is twenty thousand, well, why can't it be thirty thousand? Yeah. I mean, why, why couldn't it be 50000 And if that's the case, the amount of money that they can pour into that and and make their trillions, they could do it pretty easily. And then they could just keep pumping out ICOs. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's, you're absolutely right. And, of course, I think my take on that bubble that's is... That's not the best thing. That's not the best thing for the economy. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not wishing for that. I'm just saying no. I can see them doing it. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's not that's not real creation of wealth. That's that's artificial valuations based on on hope, based on speculation, um, and that's not even if you do think of, of investors. You know, say what you will about the stock market or or housing market bubble. It, at least investors, average investors, four when K holders, uh, it's homeowners, etc., are exposed to that type of growth. And and maybe you get okay. Well, the stock market's up ten percent this year. Maybe they're going to. Uh, well, that's what their, that, that's what they want to do. They want to put this stuff into four hundred one k's, into ETFs. That's my point. Yeah. Well, and, and if that's the case, then then it could have a very similar effect, and it wouldn't be relegated to to uh, to Wall Street or to uh, traders that that are, I guess. Oh, well, it'll start. Thing. It'll start there so that they make the most money because they'll get in at the lowest levels, and then they'll sell this to the whole world. It's a 401ks, an ETF. That's what they're pushing for, trading platforms. First, it's an institutional trading platform for Fidelity. Then they're going to have you trading cryptocurrencies just like people. They, the Charles Schwab guy joined the Coinbase board. There's all these moves going on in the background. They're not really reporting on it. And I think they're just getting ready to move a large bubble back over to crypto. I think people think the crypto bubble is over. It, it's finished. 
And I think Wall Street says, hey, we didn't participate in that. <laughs> we we want to get our own bubble gum. That's my theory. Yeah, no, and, and, and I guess – what, what else is there? And kind of what you were saying. What else is there where they can pour? So there, there can be smaller bubbles in terms of valuations or market cap. In, Marijuana stocks, sure. Sure, but how, how sure. How many stocks can you do? Sure, or, or individual commodities, uh, right. oil, uh, you know, precious metals or whatever. But that's uh, that still pales in comparison to, to something like uh, the, the size of the stock market bubble. And, and I think cryptos, you're right, that the potential for market cap there is, well, I have it in front of me right now. I mean, the current market cap for, for Bitcoin is, uh, what, $112 billion, Big you know? deal. But think of all the ICOs. Forget Bitcoin, Litecoin, that stuff. I'm talking about you could actually create. They had, I think, $240 billion worth of, of ICOs that were done by pretty much people with white papers and then pumping them on, on YouTube. Imagine what Wall Street and Silicon Valley can do with these registered ICOs at the SEC where they just bring seven or eight a week to market and they throw them out there, they pump them, they trade them, they store them, whatever they do, they can actually create an alternative market that could be 20, 30 percent the size of the stock market with that stuff. Sure. And, and, and you know, to relate it back to the stock market, that'd be that's it's it's a pretty proven strategy for stocks. Or it was there for a while. What was it? Uh, what 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 company was it that added blockchain to their name? Oh, sure, um, the blockchain iced tea. But that yes, that yes, was yes. just a company doing something. This would be organized where they would actually, and the SEC has a web page called sec.gov slash ICO, where they want people to register ICOs. Why? Because Silicon Valley wants it. Wall Street wants it. They will. It, everything they do for like the way they brought Tesla co public, they'll do that for tokens. And then I think they'll Tesla do is, coin. The, exactly. They will then <laughs> take existing companies and and tokenize them and issue coins on those. That's oh, the sorry. bubble. Sorry, it looks like there's already a Tesla coin out there. <laughs> yeah, well, but I mean, I mean from Tesla itself. Oh, I know, I know, I know, I know. Um, yeah, no, you're you're right, and 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 it, I, I have noticed that trend lately, where despite the mainstream media, yeah, not talking about crypto as much for, for, for the majority of 2018. Um, very little interest in it. You have seen some large firms move forward with these projects. Right. Uh, and, 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 you know, maybe it is more than just what, you know, some people, some pessimistic people will say, uh, maybe like myself, and, and say, like, uh, this, is, this is their plan for a, uh, not a one world currency, but a more of a digitalized currency or something like, you know, uh, whatever. Well it, well, it is. We already, we've already we been moving in that direction even before cryptocurrencies were even invented. I mean, all yeah. fiat currencies are digitized. There, you, there's very little cash involved. This is just, I think it's less an idea to, I mean, everything is tracked and traced as it is. If you put ICOs into trading platforms, when you buy stocks, anything you buy, it's all tracked and traced anyway. You'll just track and trace your crypto trading on Fidelity, on Schwab, and JP Moore, whatever it is. And I think people are already used to being tracked and traced, unfortunately. And yeah. uh, if they can make profit trading Tesla the way they, or crypto ICO the way they can make profit trading Netflix or Tesla, that's what they, that's where they're trying to usher people into. I don't even think it's nefarious. I think it's just they want to make big gains and they want to manufacture them. They don't want to wait. They don't want to see if it. I mean, Tesla should not be worth anything by 20, 30 years ago standards. It doesn't make any money. I mean, it's not investment advice to go out and short Tesla. But objective, no, but objectively, yeah. if a company doesn't make money, it has no value. And that's what cryptocurrencies can be, but on a bigger scale, because you can't even prove what the value is supposed to be. Yeah. There's yeah. no earnings. Bitcoin doesn't have earnings. It's like gold has no earnings. Yeah. But gold, well, you can figure out, well, there's a certain amount. Well, that's what they want to do with Bitcoin. There's only 21 million of them. I was like, well, what good are they? Well, everyone has one, so you have to have one, too. Well, and then there's no such thing as a, uh, a uh, uh, gold cash or uh, gold dark, or you know what I mean? Uh, Bitcoin can be uh, created right. easily. ICOs can be created, you know, by by the hundreds. Absolutely. Uh, as long as you have people promoting them, they can make them worth something, even though they might be underlying, utterly worthless. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. I mean, it's it, when when you have thin volume on some of these these coins, 
pe- people think you know uh, like like bitcoin let's say let's say bitcoin jumped from from 100 something trillion or billion to to a trillion dollar valuation in a month that doesn't mean that 900 billion dollars worth of money moved into bitcoin it just means that people were willing to pay a higher price for the Correct. bitcoin and that that artificial value can be created overnight now, of course it can it can go away just as quickly that's where i think things are headed yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's something I'll have to pay attention to as well. I mean, on one hand, my take on that bubble is probably going to be similar to the one before, even if it might be more pronounced, more widespread. <laughs> it's uh, fake. I, I, but that's we've moved into this this world of fakeness. But I think if that happened, though, I think you would see the precious metals go too. Yeah, yeah. And and, and the, the you know the other side of me is hey, I mean, if if we could participate in that, I have no moral objection to. <laughs> <laughs> making money after cryptocurrencies uh if it means i can i can uh pay bills with those profits or putting in precious metals but if the problem is for you and me understanding which ones would be the ones at wall street which i, I is it going to be the same thing you don't know when to get in <laughs> the people yeah. that get in and get in first are the ones that win big yeah yeah just just by uh you know l- last time around you you could have taken every you know at some point you could have taken the 100 top coins for the most part and bought an, an equal amount of each of them. And oh, that's just true. Set, just set a, a, a sell order at a two specific times. level. At, right. Yeah, two times, five times, whatever, depending on, on the market cap, the liquidity and whatnot. And at some point, it was rolling bubble after rolling bubble in the individual crypto market. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that, I think, I don't know how many people deployed that strategy, but it would have worked well for them um, if they had, I'm sure. There would have been the 10 coins that would have uh, dropped, but the other 90 would have spiked at some point. But... Yeah, it'll be interesting. Yeah, and and I wouldn't be surprised, like you said, if precious metals were, were taken along for the ride, not because of cryptos or anything, but no. But uh, I actually of, think of, I think cryptos, I, I think gold and silver go up also on a wealth effect. When people have money, like Chinese and Indians aren't buying; they're not stacking silver. They're buying objects of art. They're buying silverware. They're buying uh, necklaces. Maybe they they think of it preserving wealth, but they buy it because they can, because they got yeah. money now. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it'll be interesting. Interesting times we live in, and definitely a, an interesting week on, on Wall Street, precious metals. So it'll, uh, I guess I look forward to speaking to you again about this, you know, a month from now or whenever, because um, I think uh, we're certainly going to know a lot more about where this is heading. And, and is this the, uh, is this the, have we seen the top? Have we seen the bubble slowly popping now, or is this, uh, is this just a, another dip, temporary dip? But um, I got to get going. Uh, again, thanks for thank you for coming on, and I hope my uh, hope my viewers enjoyed our, our our chat today. All right, Matt. Well, thank you very much, and uh, we'll be checking out your site, and uh, you can check out Small Gold as well. All right, sounds good. Have a great day, Lewis. You too, Matt. Take care.